Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the second lecture on online algorithms. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today's lecture is going to be about matching problems. First we're going to have a look at matching from an LP perspective and then we'll talk about the online setting. We'll motivate it, show a lower bound for deterministic algorithms and also show that the greedy algorithm matches the lower bound. This analysis is via duality. Finally, we're going to consider a fractional version of bipartite matching in the online setting. In the bipartite matching problem, we have a bipartite graph. That is, the vertex set consists of two sets, L and R, for left and right, respectively, and all edges go from one set, L, to the other set, R. So a bipartite graph can look something like this. A matching in the graph is a set of its edges that do not share any common vertex. So for example, the set of yellow edges I'm drawing now is, is a matching for the graph. The objective in the maximum matching problem is to find a largest possible set of edges that make up a matching. We can formulate this as an integer program. And we're going to make use of that later. So how do we do this? It's similar to what we have seen before. So we define a decision variable xe that is going to be set to 1 if e is in the matching and 0 otherwise. Now we want to maximize the sum of these variables subject to constraints that say that this is really a matching. To formulate this as a linear constraint, we sum over all the edges incident to a vertex v and this sum needs to be less than or equal to 1 in order to satisfy the condition that there are no two edges uh, incident to this vertex chosen. This has to be true for all vertices in L and in R. So delta V here is no used to denote the set of all edges that are incident to V. Of course, as you know from previous courses, this problem, match, maximum matching, has a polynomial time algorithm for example, you may have seen an augmenting paths algorithm. So why are we bothering writing this as an integer uh, programming formulation? And the answer is that it will be a useful tool for analysis. So in particular, we are going to look at the LP relaxation of this linear program and its dual. So let's look at the primal and dual formulations of this LP. So the primal formulation is just as before. We want to maximize the sum of all xe, where xe is the variable that indicates whether e is chosen. And we want to make sure that at most one uh, edge is chosen for every vertex. And all of these decision variables need to be non-negative. In the dual, we get a minimization problem where we minimize the sum of the decision variables pv, where we have a decision variable pv for each constraint uh, in the primal, that is for each vertex we have a constraint that basically transposing the constraint matrix says that the two vertices of a particular edge, Vw, need to add up to at least one. And here one comes from the uh, coefficients in the ob objective function of the primal. Now I would like you to pause and think. So how can we interpret the variables of the dual. Now let's consider what these LPs say about the original problem. So here, because we have an relax a relaxation, any solution is going to be an upper bound on the integer solution, which is equal to the max maximum matching size. By weak duality, the dual has the property that any feasible solution that we come up with, its value is going to be an upper bound on the optimum of the primal which in turn is an upper bound on the size of the maximum matching. So the idea now is to use uh, feasible solutions to the dual to upper bound opt. Now let's get back to the online setting. So in the online bipartite matching problem, we again have the two vertex sets. One of them, L, is given ahead of time. So this we know from the start, whereas the vertices in R are going to appear online together with adjacent edges. 
each time a vertex in R appears, we need to decide which vertex in L, if any, we want to match it with. So for example, L might be given like this, a vertex appears with two edges, and we need to decide to match an edge. For example, we might match the first one, next, ver next vertex appears, we match it, next vertex appears, we are not able to match it because we, we have already matched the vertex in L to another vertex and we cannot change that matching. And it goes on like this. So we are not, go we are not forced to, to match every vertex, so we can choose not to match a vertex to uh, any of its adjacent vertices. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So now the objective, naturally, is to create a matching that is as, as large as possible, and we compare the size to the opt, the offline opt. Okay, and we would like to obtain size at least c times opt, where c is as, as large as possible. So the rest of the lecture is about trying to optimize this competitive ratio c. One application of this problem is serving uh, advertisements on online. So in this setting, L is going to be a set of, of ads that need to be shown, that have been purchased, and R is going to be a set of web page views that come one at a time. And H indicates whether an ad may be shown to a particular uh, web user based on things like ge geography and maybe if you have information about demographics and things like this. And clearly, since we don't know what web pages are going to be viewed in, in the future, uh, this is an online problem inherently. Now there are limits, as you can imagine, about how well you can do. And in particular for deterministic algorithms, it's easy to see that they cannot do too well. So consider the setting where the first vertex in R is matched to two uh, vertices, and we choose uh, one of them then it can very well be that the next vertex may connect to the vertex that you have chosen. And then we have a situation where we find a matching of size 1, whereas a matching of size 2 does exist. So opt is 2, where we get a matching of, of size 1. And in general, this can happen if we use a deterministic algorithm. It's always possible to come up with a, with a sequence of... Uh, of uh, of vertices and adjacent edges that uh, achieve this competitive ratio of, of at least or no, no better than one half. In terms of other bound, there's an algorithmic technique, which is usually the one we try first, which is the greedy approach. And in this context, the greedy algorithm would simply always add an edge to the matching if it's possible. It may be that there are several edges that we could match, but in that case, we just make an arbitrary choice. For example, we might match to the first vertex. Now, this is a deterministic algorithm, so the lower bound applies, and we can have a competitive ratio no better than one half. But as we'll see next, uh, this algorithm is actually one half competitive. The analysis of greedy that we are going to do goes via, via the dual of the LP relaxation. So the idea is to construct a feasible solution to the dual, let's call it P, uh, of cost that is at most two times the size of the matching that we get. So two times the sum of all the XEs. Now remember that the dual wants to minimize the sum of all PV, where PV is a variable associated with V under the constraint that PV plus PW is at least one for each edge U VW in E. So we want to maintain this vector P at all times. And initially, we can simply set P to zero because we have no edges whatsoever. So all the constraints are, are void. So when greedy adds an edge, let's say from V to W, uh, we need to update P to make sure that the constraints are, are met. And the way we can do this, or one way we, way we can do it, is to simply set both PV and PW equal to 2, 1. Now let's consider the size of the matching. 
since we only increase the p variables when we add an edge, we know that the size of the matching is at least half times the sum of the PV variables. In turn, this is at least half times the optimal solution to the LP relaxation, which in turn is at least half times opt. So here we use weak duality and the fact that relaxation can only increase the objective value. So a competitive ratio of one half is the best we can hope for deterministic algorithms and we have a simple algorithm that matches it. Of course, you might wonder whether randomization can be used to, to get something better, to get a competitive ratio that is strictly above one half. It turns out that it's actually possible to get a competitive ratio of approximately 0 0.632, which is 1 minus 1 over e. Unfortunately, this is too complicated or too big a topic to cover in this class, but instead we'll cover a related result that kind of contains the gist of the result, which is about fractional matchings. So here we don't have to cho either choose an edge or not, but we can kind of split the matching edge between several of the outgoing edges from, from the vertex. Now this problem, as you might have seen, corresponds exactly to the LP relaxation of the original IP formulation. Let's look at an example. So we have L on the left, R on the right. We get a couple of edges and it's possible if we want to split the matching half-half between the two. Now when the next edge comes, before we were not able to match, but now we can, it's still possible to assign a uh, weight of one-half to this edge because the first vertex V on the left hand side is only matched halfway. So the rest, if, if there's only this outgoing edge, we cannot match. We can choose to match the outgoing edges unevenly. Um, of course, it can also happen here that there's no way to add any weight, since the vertices on the left-hand side are already fully matched. Okay, this, So the sum of the corresponding decision variables is 1. We're going to study a very natural and simple algorithm for this uh, problem called the water level algorithm. So here we think about each vertex as uh, on the left as kind of a container able to hold at most one unit of, of water, so corresponding to how, mu how, how much they are matched. So basically each of them we can imagine a, a small container. And whenever a vertex comes on the right it basically has one unit of water that it can distribute among the vertices that it has edges to. So we somehow need to pour up to one unit of water to the adjacent vertices. Or maybe it's beer, because I'm going to draw it in, in a nice yellow color. Okay, so here we could, for example, split it 50-50. When the next edge comes, uh, we, can, we, we can only pour half a unit here, so we're kind of going to get half a unit uh, left over, and so on and so forth. So there might be a case where the adjacent vertices do not have the same amount of, of water in them. In this case we always fill into the least full first. So we're going to first fill the third vertex and then we're going to split the rest so that they end up at the same level. So this is the water level algorithm. It's instructive to also have a, a look at it from, from the side, so to speak. So if we think about a vertex W with one unit of water and look at all the neighboring vertices, when we start they might have different levels of, of water in them. And now we're going to pour first in the empty neighbor. When it's as full as another neighbor we start pouring in several at the same time. And at the end all the neighbors that we have poured to are going to be at the same level. So this is the water level, so to speak. So all containers that have received water from W are going to have the same level, which is uh, less than or equal to, or actually equal to the water level. So if there's some container with a higher level, let's call it YV, um, they won't have, it won't have received any, any water. And in particular, this means that 
all the neighbors that received water have a level less than or equal to y v at the end of of the pouring from w to analyze the water level algorithm we are going to take a similar approach as before so again we want to consider these lp and the decision variables xe where xe is now a fractional weight of an he and basically we want to bound the lp value by some feasible solution to the dual uh, so what we did before was basically whenever we set a decision variable to one corresponding to an hvw we set pv and pw equal to one so one possible way of generalizing this would be that if we set xe equal to some delta we could set pv and pw also equal to this delta or maybe even smaller right because we are looking for a cheapest possible solution to the dual right so let's let's look at an example of of how this might work out so we water level is going to split things four way here and we update the dual variables also drawn in blue they are all going to be one quarter now comes a new vertex with the three neighbors and we go again going water level is also going to split three way one unit of water and we update the duals then there's a vertex with two neighbors and now we're actually going to fill up the corresponding neighbors with whatever capacity there is and we're going to have some um, some spare water so we are actually only going to fill five six units of water in and then finally okay so these two last are full finally we have a vertex with just a single neighbor and it has doesn't have any capacity so we are actually not going to be able to pour any water into the its its neighbor because um, yeah the dual constraint is basically tight um, so this this kind of means that we there's no hope that we can get a better constant than than one in front of delta so we we're not going to be able to get any competitive ratio that is strictly above one half so somehow we need a, a better way to find a smaller solution to the to the dual in order to get a better bound on the on on opt and yeah the idea is to kind of deviate from what we did before which was kind of splitting the amount by which we increase the dual variables evenly and now we are going to do the split unequally we can think about increasing variables pv and pw as also pouring water into uh, containers associated with those and before we poured equal amounts into pv and pw and a total amount of of two units of of water and now we hope that we will be able to uh, get by by pouring less water and the way we are going to be splitting it is going to be controlled by a function g which is going to uh, control the rate at which water flows to the vertex in l so v uh, and this is going to depend on the current value of the dual random variables in the notes they describe how to they come up with a good choice of g and i'm not, not going to cover that but in the end what they come up with is is, is this function so it's an exponential function that uh, increases with the with the level so basically at the when the level is zero the rate of filling is going to be e to the minus one and when it's almost full the rate is going to be e to the c minus one where c is going to be the target approximation factor of course if this is the rate at which water flows to v then water is going to flow to w its neighbor at a rate which is one minus g of pv so let's wrap up the analysis so there are two things to do so first of all for every edge v comma w we need to be able to argue that the sum of the dual random variables is at least one because uh, if this is true for every edge v w uh, in the graph this gives us dual feasibility there are two cases we can consider one is where the vertex v is full at 
at the end of the water level algorithm. So in this case, we are simply going to lower bound the sum of PV and PW by PV. And the value of PV is simply the integral from 0 to 1 of T of Z, where Z indicates the current, current level of water. In the case where the vertex V is not full, so that is why V is less than, strictly less than 1, at the end of the water level algorithm, uh, we give a slightly more complicated bound. So first of all, we integrate up to YV, so that's the contribution uh, to PV, or that gives us the, the exact value of PV. And then we have to lower bound the value of P, PW. And we don't know exactly how, how much has been added to PW, but we do know that whatever was added is more than whatever would have been added if, if the neighbors had level y w, yv. And this is because uh, g is increasing. So the rate is lower bounded by 1 minus g of yv. And since uh, yv is less than 1, we know that all water from w was used. So we integrate from 0 to 1. And now we can insert the guess from before of g of z, e to the cz minus 1. And a bunch of computations, essentially high school integration, uh, tells us that the choice of c, which is 1 minus 1 over e, actually works. And an amazing thing is that this happens to actually be the best comparative ratio. So, th so there are lower bounds also that show that it's not possible to do anything better than 1 minus 1 over e. In the randomized case, it's possible to do something that is analogous, where essentially the these fractional matchings correspond roughly to probability distributions over choices of edges.